Hello viewers, welcome to our next episode of Sandy Wars, our video series on defense and strategic matters. This is in continuation to our ongoing discussions on Sandy Wars as well as our articles on India Sentinel on the India-China, LSE and border conflict. In our last episode of Sandy Wars, we had Major General Sudhakarji who is with us today and we had Brigadier retired uh, Dhilan, um, if you remember that episode which we had on Eastern Ladakh with specific focus on, um, on the Galwan episode where we had Major Sudhakarji and uh, we had RJS Dhilan, Brigadier RJS Dhilan. And we had promised you that uh, we would come back with the next logical sequence after having discussed the Eastern Ladakh conflict. So today we are back as promised. And today we have a new guest, a new panelist with us, Minya General MPS Kandal, retired. He has some very eminent qualifications to be on this discussion today, very eminent, you know. He had served as a junior officer in the Sela garrison south of Tawang. Then as a full colonel, he had played checkerboard, the war game checkerboard under General Sundarji from the red team side. And then after that, he had commanded the Dokla Brigade before going to command divisions and uh, taking other positions in the army in other sectors. But in the India-China context, you do see his eminent relevance. So today, our subject is, is China likely to attack India in the foreseeable future? And if so, then why and how of it? Now, from the side of Sandy Wars, a proposition which I am laying down is that for any country to uh, go belligerent with a neighbor, there has to be a philosophy first. This is not jaw jaw, you know, it's not just talking or, or belligerent posturing. This is about actual kinetic contact warfare. There is to be a philosophy. The country has to have a philosophy of belligerence, which has to back this move. Next, there has to be a purpose and aim for that particular campaign. And only then comes the how, how and where they will attack, etc. That comes later. Now, China, today's China, Z's China, is different from Mao's China. In 62 war, in my article in India Sentinels, <clears throat> which I researched at get great depth, and it showed readers that Mao had made up his mind as early as 1959, around September. We had quoted records that China would one day go to war with India. However, Ch Mao had a lot of ideological baggage, you know, morality baggage, the concept of just war, etc. So his concept is that he, were, he would give India long rope and you know, allow India to make a mistake to give the Kasas Belai, to give the trigger, the, the trigger which will give China the justification, the right is justification for going to war. And in and as per their point of view, that was provided by India in 1962, not in Ladakh. In Ladakh, India, through its forward posture, uh, went ahead and uh, formed posts in uh, territory with China, claimed to be the Rome, but that never led to war or even battles. China surrounded our post like at Galwan in July, uh, but that did not lead to kinetic conflict. But in Nefa, north of the MacMahon line, when India went to, as per India's perception, you know, when India went to reclaim the Thagla Ridge, which was on the watershed line, you know, that's the highest ridge there, that's according to China was a Kasas Belai, they went to war. Now today, we have a very different person, Z. He doesn't carry the ideological baggage of Mao. China has become a state capitalist country. It has embraced capitalism. It still has pretensions towards morality. It still tries to find justification for what it does. And the justification today they are quoting is China wants to reclaim its heritage and reclaim uh, territory which is traditionally they lay claim to. So Taiwan is the first flashpoint, overt, overt flashpoint, which uh, they say it's part of China and they would you know, one day make a move, perhaps soon. And all the on all the indications are there that China is preparing for a move of some sort. Next, we come to India. In Ladakh, the view of Sandy Wars is China has reached its points of interest, which is the 1959 claim line. They don't have 
uh, any uh, economic interest in Ladakh. It's a, it's a barren land. Neither India nor China has economic interests or other interests. It's only to keep India away from their strategic vital uh, arteries, you know, which connects Tibet with Xinjiang, which is G219 highway. And the, the new, uh, you know, mega artery which they have, CPEC, which connects uh, Xinjiang to the, you know, uh, to other Asian posts like Gwadar to Pakistan, etc. Now, uh, if Ladakh is not going to be the point of interest for China to go to a full-fledged war or even a short war, I don't think that, you know this is World War II time when long drawn out full-fledged fledged wars of conquest are going to happen. Short, sharp actions may, may happen if that. So our proposition is that that will happen in Nepal, I mean in Arunachal Pradesh. Where China has a grouse, they claim that entire 90,000 square kilometers, and they're grudgingly living with the fact, living with a dispute. It's a modus vivendi that India has preempted them and occupied Arunachal, but they have never accepted. So, what is the the uh, aim, you know, which can, uh, you know, which their philosophy of reclaiming their heritage, reclaiming what is rightfully theirs through uh, through aggression? What aim? will satisfy their philosophy in Indian context. Our contention that the Tawang ball, the Tawang monastery, symbolically has a huge connection with the Tibetan heritage. Now, a country like China, which practices hypocrisy, they can, you know, they can use religion, not really the theocratic or religious way, but as a cultural article. That Tawang has cultural significance for, uh, for Tibet. Tibet is part of China. China has holds suzerainty over Tibet. Dalai Lama has been away for decades and generations have lived with without Dalai Lama. They have got around Panchen Lama. Today's Tibetan youth are very different from you know the Tibetan youth of the 50s, 60s, 70s. So our proposition is that China will have a go at, at the Tawang Ball to come to the monastery. They will faint. So to put India off here, they will faint, they will uh, compartmentalize the battlefield in such a way that a faint looks real, you know. They will faint in Ladakh and in the central sector around Barahoti, for example, where they already, uh, you know, they did some mischief uh, this year. They sent in troops about five to six kilometers across the LSE, invoking the old dispute which is standing there. Very, very limited things actually. That is not a major uh, point of tactical uh, attraction for China because uh, it's a very rugged mountain, mountainous territory. Uh, there is no immediate goal for China to come up there. That will also be a faint. And finally, they will come and focus on Tawang. Now, people who have been following the conflict between Russia and uh, Ukraine, which is happening, ongoing conflict, which is really heating up now, they would have heard of the gray zone war. Gray zone warfare is where you use all kinds of non-conventional non players like infiltrators, civilian infiltrators, you know, armed refugees, encroachers. In Tawang, we have certain demographic, certain, there are certain demographic issues there which will make it convenient for China to use gray zone warfare. China, the communications, both electronic communications and road communications in Tawang are now very, very updated. So it, it won't be difficult for them. They can come up to Tawang through uh, tactical ingress via uh, the Niam Jangchu Valley. And they can occupy the advanced landing grounds which we have there in Lumpu and Zemitha, and which will allow them to move in troops by and supplies by air. And then they can go for gray zone warfare, I mean, gray zone conflict and, uh, in, in Tawang proper. Etc. That is the proposition which Sandy Was is laying down. Now, uh, I would request Mayor General Sudhakar, who was, as you would know, uh, those who have been with us, he had commanded three Dev in Eastern Ladakh uh, from uh, up to 2017 April. And that was the formation which was, uh, you know, looking after our interests from SSN, Depsang down to Galwan. He is uh, immensely qualified to talk on this subject. He has also done his stint as a brigade commander at Tawar. So both ways, he is uh, very highly you know, abreast of these issues. I would request Major Sudhakarji to give his views, please, on we, the proposition we just laid. Oh, okay. Good evening, uh, uh, General uh, Kandal, sir, and uh, Sandeep. Uh, firstly, thank you very much for inviting me to your channel. 
um, for a discussion on a extremely sensitive and relevant topic. <coughs> generally, generally, we do not participate, military officers, no matter whether serving or retired, generally they do not engage in discussions on issues related to the offensive intent of the adversary. Notwithstanding that, uh, times are changing, so as the, <clears throat> the perception as also the environment, we need to evolve ourselves and continue to change. So the moot question, keeping in view the timeline that you have outlined, the moot question which uh, the anchor is throwing is, will China attack India? I, I don't know. Nobody can say whether China will attack India or not. But let me put hypothetically in the shoes of a Chinese leader. I'll act as a Chinese today. Uh, if I'm a Chinese leader, uh, what would I look for? What is my aim? The first and foremost thing as a Chinese leader to answer this question would be, what is the aim of my country? The aim of my supreme aim of my country as in today is to be a superpower by the year 2049. This is all outlined. It's there in black and white. So hence, no dispute. We are not contesting the whites. If that be my aim to be the superpower by 2049, well, uh, how do I achieve that aim? Monetarily or economically, am I quite competent and strong to meet the requirement, emerging requirements as also the present ongoing expenses of my country? And what are the socioeconomic challenges that I have to face to call myself as a growing, uh, um, uh, progressive, forward-looking country within the paradigms of um, my cultural identity and the ethos? Well, I have money, I have wealth, I have economy, I am dominating the entire world economy, and I have overtaken the USA as far as the economic status is concerned. So now I have got a larger Navy. Navy is larger than the USA. And as far as uh, the military power is concerned, yes, I may not have an expeditionary force or my footprints all over the world as good or better than USA, but I'm growing. I have started challenging USA in matters of space as also cyber. As also the rocket <clears throat> technology, which I have recently, I have demonstrated to the world that I can pose a challenge, effective challenge to the third of USA, penetrate into its uh, <laughs> umbrella of uh, 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 anti-missile protection umbrella and hit the objective of my choosing. So therefore, in many ways, I'm well ahead of uh, USA. Plus, I have also demonstrated to the world that my, my country today is the factory of the world. It is the manufacturing hub, notwithstanding what has happened during pandemic and post pandemic or the ongoing impact of the pandemic. So therefore, should I choose India to attack? What am I achieving by attacking India? Should I select Bhutan to attack? Or should I select any of the other littoral states? Should I attack Vietnam or Japan? What should be my aim? If my aim is to assert myself and assume or uh, and claim and be accepted as a regional power first before I ascend to the hierarchy or the ladder of global power, well then somehow or the other I need to tame. It's been my historical legacy to keep my neighbors suppressed always and every time. And therefore, not be, I'm also mindful of the fact that my country has been, has suffered the, uh, the, the, the uh, the humiliation for a century. Well, people call it century, but since I belong to the very country, I'm an aboriginal China person. I know the history of China. My country has had the distinction of being bitten by not only 100 years, by thousands of years, one after another uh, slap has been imposed on us on many occasions. They have not been somehow correctly recounted in the history. Notwithstanding that, Therefore, 100 years of uh, one century of this humiliation, I should be able to use and apply to generate a kind of a, um, aspiration amongst the civil population and also 
uh, give a goal setting in a manner so that I, I actually uh, uh, keep, uh, galvanize the spirit of the nation together. And if at all there is any conflict imposed by anybody, uh, I should be able to bid them in my favor. Having said that, what are the challenges that I face as a Chinese leader today? Today, my challenges are not the external ones, but the internal ones. The internal challenges are, firstly, there is an unrest, very serious unrest in Xinjiang province, the minority community, the Tibetan community. There is a very serious unrest, which is actually building up gradually. The inner Mongolia, as also because of the factor of inequality, although I have been able to, my country has been able to lift 878 million people uh, from below the poverty line in past 30, 40 years, yet I need to constantly keep in mind that the, 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 the rich do not continue to become richer and the poor do not continue to become poorer. So therefore, I must take some money from the rich people and distribute amongst the poor. Having said that, what are the circumstances under which I'll be compelled to teach India a lesson if it doesn't tow my line or doesn't accept me let India continue to be a competitor, but if it doesn't acknowledge the fact that I am a superpower, I would like to give example to India, what happened between, Russia, uh, between Canada and um, USA. They also fought war, but subsequently Canada acknowledged that yes, USA is a very, very rising power and they settled the borders. Although they have border dispute even now, what happened with the Mexico? What happened between the South Korea and the North Korea today? There may be two different nations, but here are two states who have sat down, they have created ministries to actually resume border talks so as to have a peaceful resolution and settlement of the borders. What is happening to the Vietnam, despite the fact that we are two arch rivals? So therefore, in the first instance, I would like to attack India if India acknowledges and shows signs of reproachment and reconciliation. India should respond, as far as I'm concerned, to the offers made by uh, the leaders of my country in the preceding couple of years, 74 years of independence of India. Firstly, by Chahunlai, followed by Deng Xiaoping, twice to Atal Bihari Bajpai, followed by Rajiv Gandhi. And thereafter to Manmohan Singh, I myself, I have given an offer to Manmohan Singh in 2013 that we need to resolve the border issue at the earliest. But still, India has not responded in any form. So therefore, since my economy has... Sir, can I just come in for a second? For a second. Sir, you yeah. know, in this social media age, there are a lot of naughty people who take clips. So when you're saying I, it would be perhaps the wise in between to remind our audience you are talking on behalf of a Chinese leader getting into the Chinese yeah. mind. You never know who is going to suddenly take this clip and say, Major Sudhakarji is talking as a Chinese. Yeah. So just, just to remind the viewers and our audience that uh, I'm trying to appreciate, to answer this question, will China attack India? I'm trying to get you to the answer. So let's, I'm trying to take the viewers from the perspective of China. What gain will it achieve or accrue by attacking India? So therefore, to cut the long story short, the cost benefit analysis in management, we have learned the cost benefit analysis. Does attacking India give me or give China the advantage or contribute towards overall achievement of the aim by 2049? I don't think so. Today, despite the friction that India and China have, the economy is already booming. It has gone beyond $90 billion till October 2021 despite the friction that we have, both the nations have. So therefore, in, 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 in the perception, and since I'm trying to put my feet in the shoes of a Chinese leader, trying to analyze the issue, in the first go, if one has to respond to this question, China will not attack India under any circumstances. But should push comes to shove, if situation goes out of hand, which are the sectors where I would be, or China would be able to achieve benefits or dividends, which will, which will be out of proportion to the resources and the effort put in. One option is the Western sector, that is the Eastern Ladakh. In Eastern Ladakh, the terrain is such that with the minimum effort, one could actually achieve a lot. 
what is the aim of China going to be by attacking the Eastern Ladakh, except for teaching India again, yet another lesson that enough is enough. Or coming next is the Barahoti sector of the central sector. Yes, it's a very easy, I would say, bait. Well, I could trigger, try and uh, well, the Chinese could trigger and prove uh, what is the response of India to start with, like the way Chinese did in 1959 and 62 war. And what is the third one? Third one is the West Kameng, which is the very, very favorable and most contiguous geographically as also the ethnicity. There is, there, there is a linkage between the ethnic, ethnicity of the population so, of Tawang. So West, Tamang, West Kameng, you mean the Tawangs? And adjoining sectors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm coming straight down to Tawang because there is no time. I'm watching the time also. I'm left with three or four minutes. Mm -hmm. So therefore, therefore, what I would uh, want the viewers to understand from my perspective is that given the factor of proximity of its resources, the, the military resources to the complete eastern sector, starting from Sikkim till the northeastern point, the tri-junction of Arunachal Pradesh with Myanmar and autonomous region of Tibet, this complete sector is in proximity or closer to all the military cantonments or the camping areas or the staging points of the PLA in comparison with the central sector as also the, 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 the eastern Ladakh, one. Second, the ethnicity, as you all know, our viewers should be well aware of the fact that the geography of uh, the eastern sector, India's eastern sector, is far more difficult yet to be stabilized in comparison with the eastern Ladakh. When I say it is yet to be stabilized, the roads and the infrastructures are under construction, all right. However, because of loose soil, the young Himalayans, they do not sustain these uh, the road infrastructure which are coming up. There are frequent landslides and breakages in between. Although there is a massive effort going in. Third point, most important point, the ethnic, uh, uh, the spread from West Kameng, that is from Tawang side, you have Mompas, and as you keep going towards the eastern part of the Arunachal Pradesh, you have Christianity, the footprint of the Christianity actually spreading towards the eastern Arunachal Pradesh. Whereas in eastern Ladakh, you have a larger segment of Islamic population from Kargil onwards spreading towards Ladakh. And also, the road network which are existing today towards Eastern Ladakh have by and large have actually got developed, widened, and the connectivity has significantly improved uh, given uh, by the precedents which have come to light from 2013 till date by virtue of the fastest mobilization that the Indian Army could orchestrate, uh, be it in the Butse incident, that is the Depsang Valley, or it is in Chumar incident, or uh, subsequently in 2020 during the Galwan operation. So therefore, most likely, in my opinion, China is going to select a target which is geographically contiguous, number one. Number two, it has got an ethnic linkage. Number three, there will be a religious milestone or, or, or an objective, that is Tawang Monastery is the second largest monastery in the entire area. And third and most important point, is that there is a river which originates from uh, Chinese territory from uh, Trimur Glacier, flows down and goes and joins with uh, Tabangchu uh, at a point of confluence, thereafter joins with Manas River. This river, it actually generates a, a huge volume of water. Since I'm looking at the water resources, this perhaps would be, from the Chinese perspective, would be giving uh, adequate opportunity to divert the water source. So therefore, I would look at easy target without going in for the kinetic contact. Uh, one would prefer to exercise the three methods of warfare, psychological, legal, and media. Thereafter, uh, one would prefer to exercise and also execute or prosecute the war by means of the existing methodology of social media, subvert the minds of the civil population of Tawang and try and buy them. Mind you, in 1962, uh, the viewers would be aware of a village called a Chandal village towards Jimitang side, towards Lumpur side. This complete village had been blacklisted for several years. Even today, the civil administration, uh, administrative officials don't even visit the village. That village was in favor of China. This All the villages uh, had actually given support to the Chinese. So similarly, it's not difficult. 
All I'm trying to indicate is by carrying out subversion of the minds of the people, they will have a very easy target to be secured um, with minimum effort. With that, the area. My, the, in the my argument, so you were saying the area. Yes. Having said this, having said this, let me also bring to the to the notice of the viewers that we are not in 1962. The entire northern border has assumed a kind of a formidable defense. What used to be looked after by one company earlier in 62, you multiply by the factor of 126. I was carrying out a rough calculation today. And I, I would like to, for the purposes of national security, I would like to disclose the details, but we have out of proportion resources available all along the Northern border for effective uh, punitive action. India is in a position to give a fitting reply if it, it is pushed beyond a particular limit. That's all. Thank you so much. Back to you, Sandeep. Uh, thank you. Thanks a lot, sir. Uh, now let us go to Major General MPS Kandal and get his perspective on this entire issue. He has heard me, the proposition from the side of the channel. He has heard Major General uh, Sudhakarji, his colleague, and now he would like to say his part, sir. First of all, Mr. Mukherjee, thank you for bringing me out of the caution hole from somewhere and uh, having me participate in this. Uh, very astute points have been mentioned by Mr. Mukherjee and uh, Jan Sudhakarji. You see, there must be an issue to a conflict. Everything arises from there. And the issue to conflict goes back after 49 PRC comes into picture. There were only two issues. One was earlier Tibet, the sovereignty of China. China was the new regime, PRC was keen to remove that word sovereignty and integrate Tibet as part of China. This was one issue. And the second issue was from Chinese side, the offer to demarcate, delineate the boundary. This offer came from the Chinese side. Entire history of that dialogue from 50 up to 60s is by Chinese offers that for some reason we did not take. Rather, the government at that time refused to even discuss. And the reason for that, in my judgment, while we had the, based on 1914 conference, we had the some rudimentary alignment called McMahon line on a small scale maps with whatever resources available at that time. So there was some sort for the Eastern sector, for the Western sector, which is now we are calling Ladakh, there was no such thing because in 1914, Jammu and Kashmir with Ladakh its part was not part of that 1914 conference. That conference was between British India Tibet as suzerain of China and China. So that, so the Western side, the Ladakh remained out of any negotiations. And what we are today talking claim line, that is what that was offered. The interesting thing is, how did we in India assume that alignment in Ladakh Whatever when in uh, JNK integrated with India, 26 uh, October, as everybody knows, 47, we took what was available as the international boundary between Ladakh and north of it. Interestingly, though there are various uh, alignments offered, everybody knows those two. Uh, alignments by the British officers. Before that, today we are talking 
sometimes in the Sikh empire, before that something else. But the fact is that we had no agreed alignment of the boundary in Ladakh. So the initial offer of China came for that, which the government of India just refused to accord. Reason for that is for anybody to research. My own opinion is that at that time, the star of Indian army vis-a-vis -vis China and PLA was very high. Look back our history. So it was sort of assumed and we issued maps as it suited us, which included Aksai Chin and the boundary was marked and the maps were issued. China on the other side issued different maps to which when we raised the issue was said, we shall settle it later. So I am making two points. First, it is the discord came from Tibet on Tibet, which we accepted and there was no more any issue as far as China and Tibet was concerned. But this issue of the boundary, so-called boundary in Western Ladakh uh, and the alignment remained. That blew up into, let us put it in simple terms. In but he, Eastern Ladakh, sir, you mean Eastern Ladakh? Alignment in Eastern Ladakh? No, Eastern to right Western Ladakh, Galwan now we are talking about, right up to that, the, their claim line is what is Galwan today, we are saying. That was 59 offer. So what my, now I come to, my view is quite different because the question raised was, will it attack? And as we've heard General uh, Sudhakarji also and Sandeep, it's a very major issue it just will not stop. Suppose there is a conflict of this kind of a magnitude, which is deliberately brought about by China, then it's a very, very uh, serious issue. In fact, when we look at the history, it's quite the reverse of it, that it came to 62, as uh, Mr. Mukherjee said, because we had, in their perception, got across the uh, McMahon line and occupied Thagla. And it was on the strength of the Indian army. The tribe that, that was, we didn't occupy Thagla, we tried. Sir, no, tried, they had occupied, which we wanted to vacate, Dola. Everybody knows that. So in their perception, we triggered that. We triggered that. And yes, in my judgment and whatever is in the on the internet about the uh, famous report uh, that everybody knows, though it is still not classified, but it's available internet. And Mr. Mukherjee had widely researched and quoted from that. We as the Indian army totally underrated the Chinese, including their buildup. Leaving that aside, they took 62 both in Ladakh and in uh, Arunachal and vacated it by their, on their own will. After that, everybody knows the parley started 87, 88, Rajiv Gandhi going, various other intermediaries. Yes, I must refer to checkerboard, which uh, Mr. Mukherjee, after my tenure, in the MO directorate, I was privileged to be in faculty of studies and the commandant was General Tomer. For whatever reason, he took me as a staff officer with him. And so I had the privilege of having a ringside seat. But today I confess to you that war game also like every war game in my entire career always started taking it for granted that war has commenced. Invariably, we assigned some reason. Whereas today's discussion is, will it attack? If the answer is yes, then comes the next question, where and when? 
But my question is, will it attack? I think it does not need to attack at all because its intention is simply to have that leftover problem of clearing the border alignment, which actually, like General uh, Sudhakar ji has said, will relieve China from any engagement south of Tibet with India. It relieves it for facing Taiwan. Now its enemy number one is, or adversary is US, not us. Plus it can devote itself to internal matters. If China ever wanted either the Wang or any other place, so far, we were never in a position. That's the fact. You can do relative strengths. Even till today, I don't know what is our force levels. All three structures, are they through a war game with relative strengths that we are, though General Sudhakar ji has said, we are capable of. Well, every army must that's what we thought in 62 also. A whole division was on that single disused, practically uh, single axis in the high altitude, the Wang to Sela. A whole division was there. A brigade plus was in the Wolong sector. And yet we didn't do well. So I won't take it for granted. So that part does not belong to me. I'm not competent to even look at relative strength, whether we'll be able to hold or not. But my own uh, thought and suggestion is, China's intent is to settle the border. Of course, they would like to do it on their terms. It is for our negotiations. And the military strength must provide that negotiating power to the government of India to negotiate. It is in our interest also for perpetuity to settle that border, negotiate, settle, align. And military must provide that underlying strength so that government of India can do that. Why I say... Mm. Yes, sir. General Kandal, you are saying. Yeah. So you see, we've discussed what China may want. But as a nation, it is for us to decide our objective, irrespective of what. Do we want to perpetuate the conflict, which seems to be one very strong view, which even goes to say, like Subraman Swami, that align with USA, get weapons, that will that actually demands that there is a continuous deployment remain. That's one, one view, which assumes China as the bad guy will do. Second view, which I offer to you is this, that it is time to settle that border. And there is every indicator that all that China is doing is pushing us towards this. It does not want any additional territory. It's got good enough. I mentioned about Tibet. It's resolved that. And as far as security of, now there's a railway line from Chengdu to Lhasa. Uh, 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 one of these uh, super trains are running on that. So the military strength wise, whether as a country, economy, other factors taken in, we want to perpetuate and hope that we'll take on China militarily and solve what? What will we achieve? Capture some territory? No. So the offer is from, my, and I say this because you look at the history. China has accepted every offer. Vajpayee went there in 2003. They accepted Sikkim as part of India, which they were not doing earlier. And we accepted TAR as part of China. You, there is no indicator to say that China threw its weight on India post-62 withdrawal. Rather, it came forward to even sign that 93 agreement, 2003 agreement, subsequently up to 2013. And whatever we are looking at, whether it is Doklam 
on uh, Ladakh and these villages coming up. Yes. The, as I read it, China is more than willing. Please come forward, negotiate, and we settle this matter. That will enable China to settle its issues with USA vis-a-vis -vis, um, Taiwan and also manage its internal things in all the three uh, provinces mentioned by Jan Sudhakarji and anybody. Everybody knows its internal problems. <laughs> Why would want it want to take on more? Sir, I have one request, sir. General Kandal, yes, sir. I have one request from you. You are, you are a repository of some very precious knowledge which will one day be lost to history as Indian military history is extremely disorganized. On behalf of our viewers, I'll request you. This will also help our subject today and posterity. When you played from red team side, General Sundarji's Operation Checkerboard game, just for context for our viewers, Operation Checkerboard coincided with Operation Falcon, where uh, after 62, that was the first yes, major yes. point of conflict. And uh, I right. don't want to get into details there, but you know, General yeah. Sundarji had air flown a brigade uh, to, uh, you know, to Zemithang Circle and uh, occupied all the commanding heights there and and China had initially gone into the dialogue, into the threat mode of we'll teach India a lesson, but they had uh, very, very tamely China had gone under after that and whatever both General Sudhakarji and General Kandala mentioned about Raposhma and uh, uh, Rajiv Gandhi going and then all the rest of it which happened, India was in a position of strength. Now, during that time, Operation Checkerboard happened and General Kandahar, during that time, a full colonel, had played from the red team side with the China side. I want our viewers not to lose out on that very precious knowledge. Very precious, sir. And my, mind you, Indian military history is not organized. So I want uh, that report, sir. Please share with our people. What was uh, China? Uh, how did China, playing from China's side, like under, general, under the ages of General Tomar, when you organized it? What was China's feasible, uh, you know, modus operandi? Uh, uh, Mr. Mukherjee, as you noticed, I cannot arrogate to myself at that level that I could have a, a proper vision and understanding of the whys of war. In fact, all that I can say is this, that General Tomer is still around in Dehradun. I recommend you could sometimes approach him. He'd give you, but even there, it was based on the JIC, famous JIC paper. And I don't know, General Bhardwaj would, uh, General Sudhakarji would know about the JIC uh, document. Those days they talked of 33 division. That was assigned to him. And he, we were required to work out the time for logistics in those days when the highways were restricted, three central. Today, the, so I would only put it this way that the issue started by an assumption that China will go to war with 33 division and virtually 10 divisions coming through the uh, Chumbi Valley. And I, as even a brigade commander in 1990, we were talking about that. That is why the defensive posture in Sikkim, which I've just mentioned, that uh, North Sikkim, East Sikkim and Bhutan. It is from that 10 divisions, but whether it is so now, everything is changed. But you are right in saying one thing. And I, I disagree with you. When you say we were in a position of strength, for a second, suppose China had not pulled out. Do we really, we are talking military, were we really in a position to take on China in 87, we also quote 67, which was virtually an artillery duel. That's the truth of it across Nathula. So somebody must do a greater analysis to, to make that statement, which Mr. Mukherjee, you did, that Samdurong Chu, there are various claims. General Sharma, as, who was the chief, has made in his interview, which you would have seen. But to me, what I'm saying 
is it not time for India to make its objective clear? And that is one or the other to perpetuate conflict with China or to settle the problem with China. And to this, my thesis or my humble opinion on the second side, China has been pushing you to do the latter. As far as if it will attack, I leave it to those who wear the uniform today and carry the burden of that. But we on the outside today, we should look at the historical indicators in reading. You read it differently. I read it like this, that if China was always a greater strength than us, even in the nuclear, you know, 64, everybody knows it. They were far ahead in the military strength. Today, uh, people are talking uh, AI, everything else. To, therefore, it would be in the greater interest of India to think of not appeasement in our own interest, unless we, we want to feel that soldiers' lives don't matter. And the politician, it suits the politician to continue conflict. Very, very, very well. And, uh, General Kandal, what you have said, that last line is uh, prophetic. Does the soldier's life matter? And can we talk academically on a subject which involves blood and gore and involves yes, endangering, endangering the lives of soldiers for a few kilometers of barren territory? So it's very point is very well taken, sir. Now, if I can summarize on behalf of uh, the channel, I think a lot of information has come in which is very substantial. The channel's proposition was that philosophically, China is attuned to assert itself through other means. Uh, you know, war by other means is politics, but war again has different dimensions. Conflict. Uh, becomes kinetic, you know, where the hardware gets used. And we know six days war of Israel vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the Arabs and what happened. Even a four-day war is now sufficient to assert one's claim. So that is one part. Our proposition was that if it happens, it will happen in the Tawang war because of the, the only worthwhile aim for China, which goes with the philosophy of, of civilization assertion, is available in Tawang. Uh, General Sudhakar ji made it clear that, uh, you know, in terms of global geo strategy, China does not gain through a kinetic conflict with India at this point. They do not. It doesn't serve their purpose. But if it, for some reason, like in 1962 also, we, it was inscrutable why China would go to war. For the Indian side, one didn't know that China would actually go to war. If it happens, General Sudhakar ji has said that. Uh, Tawang makes the most sense, you know, West Coming Division, uh, which is technically called Subsector West Coming. That's, that place makes most sense because of military reasons and for political reasons to go for the Tawang Ministry. General Kandal holds a view that these are all hypothetical. We don't know anyone's mind. But according to General Kandal, that going by China's record, they have always looked for a solution from the very beginning. And they have, when possible, they have stood on the side of a solution for whatever reason, India had not reciprocated and things had become ugly. After that, he says that China has again, you know, been reasonable where Sikkim was concerned, for example. They have accepted India's claims where it didn't hurt their vital interests. So why not now finish this blood feud, you know, for once and for all and not unnecessarily tax our economy and our army you know, in a futile standoff for decades and a never ending decade, so to say, because war is not a funny thing, it's not a map exercise. So, if at all it can be solved through dialogue and by some given day, it should be done. That is General Kandal's view. Now, I would like to just point out to our viewers and our esteemed guests that if we look at what's happening, this to sum up, and I'm not opening a fresh round of argument, it has all the makings of someone shaping a battlefield. I don't for a moment think that the disturbances in the northeastern states, very unfortunate events, one after another, apparently unrelated. Mizoram Assam border, major ambush, unfortunate ambush and loss of lives, including CEO in Manipur. And then what has happened in Nagaland now, which is absolutely mysterious, wrong ISR, 
one cannot really fathom what, what could have led to this, is alarming. We have three core, Indian three core, looking after that area. And by all accounts, a lot of units have been moved to for the Northern Command for this standoff in LSE. And AR Assam Rifles was largely looking after this area. Militarily, I would leave it to our viewers and to our guests to just contemplate that what this kind of thing which is happening you know, uh, in the Northeast, what it could mean in the worst case scenario. Uh, General Sudhakarji and I had discussed in the past that what the power outage in Bombay, uh, Mumbai last year, the implications if China had a hand. We don't know. We, we don't even want to speculate about certain mishaps, other mishaps, very major high ticket mishaps which have happened in India. We don't want to speculate on that. But I will leave it to our guests. Uh, eternal vigilance, you know, is the price one has to pay for peace. I will leave it to our guests and the, the finest military minds of this country to please ponder on this. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you for coming and gracing the occasion. Thank you for sharing your extremely privileged information which you have shared with us. We will forever appreciate, be appreciative of that and it's our privilege to have you here. On behalf of our viewers, I will wish you a very good night. General Kandal, General Sudhakarji. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.